Well, thank you all so much for coming and joining us today on a beautiful first day of autumn. Feels like a good time to gather and hear some poetry and think and talk about um, the wonder of everyday things in our lives and how much they change us. So um, thanks to all of you. My name is James Cruz and I am joined with Rosemary Watula Tromer and Laura Foley, a new resident of Lebanon, New Hampshire. Um, she defected from our shared <laughs> Vermont land and uh, she's now in New Hampshire. So um, I just, I wanted to start with a few poems. I, I wanted to, um, I love starting with this one that is about wonder and amazement and um, is also a love poem for my husband who teaches me about the natural world and how to be joyful and amazed every day. And it begins, the, the title comes from a Mary Oliver quote that a lot of you probably know. Um, it's something like, when it's over, I want to say that I was a bride mm -hmm. married to amazement. I was the bridegroom holding the world in my arms. Um, so this poem is called Married to Amazement. The man I married sat next to me after our wedding. October light pouring in over dusty pews as he loosened his tie and sipped from a cup of apple cider, closing both eyes to savor the taste. Now I think I didn't marry him so much as his amazement for the everyday. The way he still gasps each time we see something new, a baby painted turtle plodding through a stream in the quarry, or a neon orange caterpillar inching across crisp leaves on the trail. How he kneels to film it from every angle, while I crouch beside him in awe of his awe, learning all that I can. <laughs> And um, I actually tell that story in the introduction to the new anthology that we're partly here to celebrate today, The Wonder of Small Things. Um, and I'm going to be sharing poems of my own and, and by other folks from this anthology today. The, the next one I want to share, and then we're, we're going to just kind of hand it off and do a little round robin sharing of all of our poems so that we have a gathering of voices. Um, the next poem I want to share is by um, Alberto Rios, wonderful uh, poet of the Southwest. And this one is called The Broken. Something is always broken. Nothing is perfect longer than a day. Every roof has a broken tile, every mouth a chipped tooth. Something is always broken, but the world endures the break. The broken twig is how we follow the trail. The broken promise is the one we remember. Something changed is pushed out the door, sad perhaps, but ready, too ready for the world. Something is always broken. Something is always fixed. <laughs> so share some next prose, Mary. On a day when the wind is perfect, the sail just needs to open, and the world is full of beauty. Today is such a day. On a day when the wind is perfect, the sail just needs to open, and the love starts. Today is such a day. That's Rumi, version by Coleman Barks, and uh, or rather Danny Ludinsky. And I love this idea. This is the wonder, the awe of 
poetry is that poetry asks us to open the sail. That's what we're doing. That's what paying attention is, right? It's just opening the sail of the mind, opening the sail of the heart, and suddenly we're available, honestly, no matter what's happening. Well, so what's hap- we're available to what's happening and to, and to the enormous spectrum of what's there, the wonder of it, the, the fear of it, the all of it, um, which is, I think, very much the... The premise of my book, All the Honey, is very much a, a book about showing up to meet the all of it, the devastation and and just bliss. <laughs> uh, I, I was afraid that I couldn't put all of those things into one book. Uh, the book came out just after my son, well, it came out this April, but I was asked to write it just a few months after my son had taken his life. And I wasn't sure how to incorporate poems of devastation with poems that were about falling in love with the world. I didn't even think it was possible. And now I can't imagine that I would have thought anything else because that really is what we're asked to do is to meet all of it uh, in one body. So of course one book would try and would have this availability to show up for it all too. So inspired by what you just read, I think I'll do this um, one uh, about brokenness. What could be more wondrous than having a body? Temple, oh body, cracked bell that still sings when struck. Oh leaky cup, oh broken stem. I love you, body your crooked path, your crumbling walls, your faulty math. I love the way you stopped believing you could ever hold it all. How you began to let yourself become the one who is being held. I love the graffiti on your inner halls, the scrawled names of all who shaped you. Oh, body, my wreck, my holy glove, my street-worn soul, my crumpled page, forgive me for years of trying to fix you, for believing the fable of whole. You, my perfect wounded heart, my stuttered him, my sacred begging boy. By the way, I just recently found out that that gorgeous Mary Oliver idea of being the bride, I want to meet, you know, death as the bride grown to amazement, was Shakespeare. It was from Shakespeare. Mm. I'll send you the quote. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Shakespeare by a Mary Oliver sounds good. Go. <laughs> <laughs> she translated it for us. I think I, I will um, <clears throat> take off on the, some of the, um, the sense of, uh, of darkness and also wonder and really that question of how we go through times that are difficult. Um, it was really uh, fun going through the my different material to decide what to read today with the idea of the wonder of small, wonder of small things, wonder of small things. And I, so many uh, do address that. And also the ordinary. Um, and a lot of that for me centers around uh, grandchildren. But this one is not. <laughs> They'll come. Someone. I once lived on a great wide river, a time of deep aloneness after loss. How soothing it was to watch waters passing, sunlight reflected in circular currents, a white moon cresting above the shadowed mountain. I miss the river, though not the hushed quietness of that time, the endless plumbing of depths I never guessed, which nonetheless led me to choose a wife calling me from another room 
as she is now, to come downstairs for tea, steeped to the color of the river. <laughs> and, um, and this one that is um, the body, as you were bringing in the body, how we are in bodies. Into the silky water, at almost five, She's learning to care how words can hurt, and so tells me, I look pretty with my tummy hanging out. They're <laughs> 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 both in bathing suits. And now I look down at my ample belly, and she continues, I don't want to say you look silly, <laughs> I, I take her hand. Yes, darling, I understand. As we tiptoe through new grass to the summer pond, Grandma, you're beautiful. She speaks as we leap into the silky water like two glittering fish. <laughs> May we all let our ample <laughs> I love them so much. And children bring us so much into the space of wonder and awe and just appreciation of the little things in life. I, you know, I, I'm so appreciative of that sort of open, wide open innocence and and I often talk, just as I read that poem earlier about my husband, I often talk about his childlike way of gasping. He doesn't always like being described. <laughs> um, but I often talk about that because it just reminds me of this sort of innocent, pure place that we have, we still have in ourselves. We're just not always accessing it. Um, and so I want to read another poem. This is another one of my own from the wonder of small things, um, in which Laura and Rosemary both have poems as well. Um, and this one is called Awe, and came to me after a snowstorm. I think I wrote it actually when we still didn't have power because we were without power for several days, um, which makes me think that even though I'm annoyed when power outages happen, maybe they're a good thing for poetry because <laughs> then you're sort of forced mm -hmm. to be with yourself. and and the page. So this one is called Awe. It's a shiver that climbs the trellis of the spine. Each tingle a bright white morning glory breaking into blossom beneath the skin. It can happen anywhere, anytime, even finding the sleeve of ice worn by a branch all morning, now fallen on a bed of snow. You can choose to pause, pick it up, hold the cold thing in your hand, or not. Few tell us that wonder and awe are decisions we make daily, hourly, minute by minute in the tiny offices of the heart. Tilting the head to look up at every tree turned into a chandelier by light, striking ice in just the right way. So something good came out of that power. <laughs> um, the next poem I'd like to share is actually by... Um, a local poet, I'm going to embarrass her a little, <laughs> Marjorie Moorhead, and, um, and she has a new book coming out soon called Every Small Breeze that I was honored enough to um, write. I don't like to say a blurb, I say a blessing, so I was honored, <laughs> honored to write a blessing for the book. And um, I recently recorded the audio for this anthology and had such a good time reading all of these poems, but I was I was genuinely struck again when I, I read Marjorie's poem. I just thought, oh, 
this land so well for me. And it's, it's such a delight when a poem, a poem you know just hits you in, in a slightly different way and, and illuminates the world again. So this is Marjorie Moorhead, and um, the title is Head in the Clouds. The cloud so distant from me here on earth, on this wood of our deck, on two feet, looking up. I reel it in and imagine droplets misting my face, tears or shower, relief, renewal. It's all there in a white fluffy ball, changing semblance in winds that come from all directions. Able to morph, adapt. Can I be a cloud? May I take it as my cotton-filled pillow, tuck it under my head, let muscles relax, and dream visions come. I send thoughts up and away, near and far, supportive and sieve-like. I will bring cloud down, wrap it round, wear it as a shawl or skirt. I will twirl, letting cloud take what shapes it may. I know there are days I laugh aloud, and in some feel enveloped by trepidation. Let me remember, while still free from shroud, to lift my gaze and not ignore. In that space and time of each given day, whichever season, let me adore, adore. <laughs> Beautiful poem. Well, I'm thinking about what you said about ch children do. They have, of course, the often natural sense of wonder. And I think it's interesting for us to think about I used to do a lot of work, social work, with people with young children, and I remember I was in a class one time, and they asked us to think about our earliest memories, and so many of us, our earliest memories of play were outside. Our earliest memories at all were outside, and, and that relationship that we have with the natural world is so essential. I don't know if you think like I do, I'm like, what do we, are kids outside these days? <laughs> because I think we need to be, but this is a this is an early memory of um, what it was like to be outside at five, along the lake and down the hill. The road dead ended into a meadow with a wooden fence. A girl could slip through, and slip through she did. <laughs> that five year old version of me, she slipped through the gaps into tall green grass and then wandered to the lake where the weeping willow hung over the shoreline, and she could sit beneath its shade and disappear. Or perhaps more rightly, she could show up as herself. Show up not as a girl who lived up the road, but as shade, as shore, as tree, as cloud, as field, as green beyond the fence. Perhaps it only happened once or twice that journey past the dead end, but 47 years later, I remember the dissolution. How beneath that tree, I was no longer who I was, only more so. I knew myself as integral to the miracle. There were whole decades I forgot her, that infinite version of me. Tonight, I can tell she never left. How did she ever fit in my limited sense of self? What does she have to teach me now of fences, of shadows, of sitting quietly, of the art of slipping through? Mm -hmm. I think I may not have read that poem before. I'm trying to do poems I haven't really read before. Um, I think you all, people who are in um, in the Zoom room, because I know a lot of you have come to poetry readings with me before and you've seen them a lot, so I'm trying to do things that you haven't heard. 
Um, this, this one is called Emerging Self-Portrait. I think that you too maybe know from times of loss that you really get to know yourself in a new way when you're met with a, with a major grief. And it's a chance to lose a lot of things you thought were important. They aren't important anymore, and you can learn a lot about what it is to be alive in these moments. So that's what this poem is about, and then I'll end it with a little, there's been a poem from Gregory Orr that's helped save me in the last couple of years, so I'll end my poem with a little version of one of his. Emerging Self-Portrait. I now know myself as helpless. Helpless the way a rake is helpless. Helpless as knife, as needle, as match, as a pen is helpless. I know what it is to not function. Despite potential, despite history, I know how it is to lose all agency. Though once I could stitch, could fix, could bring light, I know can't. I know out of the question. Infeasible, undone, no go, unable to speak, unable to rise. This was the moment when love arrived. Love with its 10,000 hands. Love with its perfect skeleton key to enter every door of me. Not that I asked, not that I deserved it, not that I said yes, but love arrived on grief's strong wings. And I, a sapped and broken thing, am learning to know myself as free when I depend on love's skillful hand. I'm learning to trust love, even when it turns my eyes toward what I wish most not to see. And love whispers to me, isn't it beautiful? Not to make loss beautiful, but to make loss the place where beauty starts, where the heart understands for the first time the nature of its journey. By the way, it's just a matter of time. If you've ever been to a poetry reading with me before, you know it's really just a matter of time before I cry. <laughs> so, uh, I'm okay. You don't have to worry about me. <laughs> well, I feel um, drawn to read a poem, which is it's called Joy and Sorrow. And it's, um, it's it really came out of the time when I was so happy. Uh, I just noticed that I was so happy about my my grandson being born, and um, it was like I couldn't sleep. You know, it was like I wanted to sleep. I wanted to go to sleep, but I was just too happy. <laughs> so it was like it was, it was had it was painful. Um, so you know, there's that too. I mean, there are emotions. Grief is an emotion, and joy is also an emotion. Uh, so I just started thinking about that, and I, I had this feeling that I just couldn't. I couldn't settle and be just normal because I was just so, you know, so darn happy. <laughs> Joy and sorrow. Both emotions weigh about the same, but one opens you up like a cavity, a well of darkness you think will never fill. The liquid loss of a friend's voice, the way she turned a phrase, the others like inhaling helium. So you walk the same street on the same tired feet, but hardly notice the impact, not feeling heal or soul on cold pavement, light as a leaf riding a breeze. 
when you hold your grandson for the first time in his little star suit. <laughs> his two pools of deep blue beam into you. His long fingers curl and uncurl like lilies at dawn or dusk. Air you still breathe as you hover that night like a balloon over your bed, still hearing your friend's waterfall notes, finally knowing both joy and sorrow are holy. Mm. Wow. Um, this is uh, a poem I want to read about my granddaughter, um, Eleanor, who I took to see the Little Mermaid in right in Hanover, uh, <coughs> just in this summer. And it was her first time being in a movie theater. <laughs> From such depths, we, of course, we were late. For the, you know, we got in late. <laughs> <laughs> we groped for seats in darkness made black by our sight, still used to the bright afternoon, as mermaids navigate with ease on screen in deep, dark seas. When the witch appears, Eleanor shouts to the room, it's going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> and then again, when the shark opens its gaping mouth, when I begin to think I know from what depths her faith swims, <laughs> having transcended at five her need for a wheelchair, walking freely into the theater, into a future we adults once only hoped was possible. Halfway through, I whisper, want to get popcorn? But the pleasure of that distraction can't match her anticipation. No, Grandma, I want to watch. I know what's going to happen next. <laughs> Later, a warm summer downpour turns the street to sea, soaks through our clothes, as we stand under a cleansing eve, reach out our hands, sticky with ice cream. <laughs> you want to read your poem from here, Lost and Found? Why don't you read it? Do you want me to read it? Yeah. Okay, I'll read it. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to read Laura's poem. <laughs> um, this is actually one of my favorite poems. It's, it's a very short poem. And I think, as you can tell, Laura is so good at bringing readers into the moment with her. And this is one of those that taps back into what we were talking about with the childhood innocence, that idea of, you know, slipping through the fence and just finding this private space of joy and wonder. And um, so I often use this poem in writing workshops, especially with younger people or people who haven't written very much, because it kind of just opens up the door like, oh, I remember what it was like that first moment when I was just kind of carried away by wonder or awe and that the rest of the world disappeared. Um, Laura captures it so well in this. So this is Lost and Found. It's kind of weird to read it with you sitting right here. <laughs> We're going to try to do it justice. <laughs> you should like rate him when he's just. <laughs> you could like have cards, you know, like the Olympic judges. <laughs> Lost and Found by Laura Foley. <laughs> On my sophomore science field trip, to the rocky Maine coast. I sat captivated by a tidal pool, a little village of crawling crabs, snails, starfish darting, a sea anemone appearing to sing. I stayed so long, I forgot the rising tide, my teachers, classmates waiting on the bus. On the exam, I couldn't calculate pitch of waves or chemical composition of anything. <laughs> but I knew how to lose myself in the world of tiny shifting things.
There's so many poems. I mean, it's it's such a pleasure for me to put together these books because it feels like pulling together a community of like-minded people, of poets, people who are really paying attention to the world, and which is what good poetry does for me, I think. And um, so it just, it's such a pleasure. And then, you know, after I've compiled it often, you know, it takes a while for things to be published. And then I realize, I guess like the best creative acts, I was really doing this for me because it reminds me how to be in the world, how I want to show up, and how to find wonder in times of difficulty, grief, and how to, when we are unaccountably happy, how to be fully present to that and maybe even see how a deep joy and sense of wonder can coexist with sorrow at the same time, and we can just be alive to all of it. So, um, so as I flip through now, it's it's really hard to choose a poem um, from all of these, which feel almost like um, I don't know, just children that I've I've shepherded into one place. Um, but I, I think I will I will read a little poem by one of my mentors, Ted Kuzer, um, who's a former U.S. Poet Laureate Pulitzer Prize winner, who's um, now in his 80s and is still writing poems that knock my socks off. And um, this is one of those just about a very small thing. This is called A Glint. I watched a glint of morning sunlight climbing a thread of spider's silk in a gentle breeze. It shinnied up from the tip of a dewy stalk of grass to an overhanging branch, then disappeared into the leaves. But soon another followed, and then another, glint after glint, and though they made no sound, what I could see was music, not melody, but one clear, shining note plucked over and over as if the sun were tuning the day, then handing it to me so I could be the one to play it. Uh, I love this idea of getting lost in the tide pool, of that being the most essential knowing is the losing of the self in this. Um, you know, I think about poetry a lot. There's two ways. There are two kinds of poems you can write. You can write the poem that is all about, I am this. And I think, you know, there's a lot of those poems about, this is me, this is my identity. And you can also write the poem about losing the identity. And I think they're both so valuable. They're both so valuable. So many ways to do it right, friends. But this is one about losing it. Losing it. <laughs> it was a tiny percentage I knew, but still, there was some French royalty somewhere in my blood. I would spend hours imagining myself in my proper place, in a long pink dress and a thin gold crown in a castle on a green hillside, doing needlepoint, no doubt, nibbling bonbons, and so, when I again asked my mother to tell me about that part of our heritage, she told me, it's so little blood, and you've had so many skinned knees. I'm pretty sure you've bled it all out by now. <laughs> <laughs> and I was instantly less grandiose. <laughs> that was perhaps the first identity I was aware of losing. But soon after that, I was no longer blonde. And soon after that, I no longer lived in Wisconsin. And soon after that, I was no longer a scout. Everything I thought I knew about myself did not last. Those notions, oh, oh, those litany of losses, those notions of who we are, how they shed, they spill, they slip off. And as, we're, as they're lost, we usually rush to replace them. I became worker, lover, parent, friend, 
We wear them so close, these identities, that we no longer see them as separate. We think they're who we are. What if we skinned not just our knees, but our thoughts, and let all those roles escape? Who would be left to walk through the field this evening to see the double rainbow stretched across the east? Mm. And um, do you think, well, all right, I'm gonna just do something very silly. There's, you know, uh, there's room for wonder really everywhere, including uh, in your kitchen when you're cleaning. <laughs> because I write a poem every day. Because I write a poem every day, I write a lot of poems about very everyday things, like cleaning your kitchen. And uh, there's a poem that I love by Richard Peabody. It's Falling in Love with the, Mor the Morton Salt Girl. <laughs> which is all about exactly that. <laughs> and I give this idea to you too. Just fall in love with something that you really wouldn't fall in love with. Any character, any, you know, Tony the Tiger or Captain Kangaroo or whatever. Uh, I want an interlude with Mr. Clean. <laughs> I want to find him in my kitchen with his big muscled arms and his spotless white shirt. Call me James, he'll say, as I pour him a glass of Sauvignon Blanc. And he'll pull out a permanent black marker and write his name on the glass? What are you doing, I'll ask. When I'm around, there's a host of crafty possibilities, he'll say. And then he'll pull out his white magic eraser and swipe the permanent marker away. <laughs> and then he'll give me a... Spin, a, a spin, a spin, open for me your oven door. <laughs> James, I'll see you don't mean that I will bring my legendary clean to your oven glass. Why, yes, Rosemary, I can lift grease build up from hard to reach places. <laughs> then he'll give me a flex, the kitchen sink next, and he'll swagger across the room and I'll swoon. <laughs> James, I never knew you'd be so, so adept at sticky residue. <laughs> and I'll guide his hand to my faucet. <laughs> say goodbye to water spots, he'll say with a grin, and his teeth will flash white as brand new backsplash tile like unused white linoleum, and we'll dance together across the sparkling floor, our sponges in hand, drawn to whatever's dirty, <laughs> and the room will smell of meadows and bleach and <laughs> rain, and darling, he'll say, don't you think it's time you took me to the bath? <laughs> <laughs> I have a small follow-up. In the back of in the back of the book, I have a bunch of endnotes that have silly little stories like this. Mr. Clean actually is not named James. Um, I gave him that name without knowing that his real name was. Does anybody know? Bob. There was uh, Bob. Uh, Bob. It, it's bizarre. They had a contest where name Mr. Clean, and the name that people voted on was Verity. Oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> James is such a great name, right? <laughs> Do you have a Mr. Clean? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I do have a butterfly. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, yes. So how to access, the, one way to access the natural world um, for us is to take a, a find a butterfly, and, I mean a, a caterpillar, and bring it inside. A monarch was always fun, you know, when the children were little and watched it, watch it uh, develop. So um, I still do it. And one year we had a, a beautiful, um, beautiful fellow. He, uh, Thing is that we know it's a male, and he opened a bit late to let it go. Usually, of course, we release it and let it fly off to Mexico. But this one was uh, born in October, so 
um, poem is named Octubre, which is what we named the butterfly. And I was trying to learn Spanish. My wife is Spanish. And um, so one way was by you know, naming some of my poems Spanish names, some of our butterflies. With, and we have another one, another butterfly was named Complian Años, <laughs> birthday. Yeah. So this one's about Octubre. If you saw me driving in this pelting rain, You'd never guess my errand to buy lilies for my butterfly. He'll savor the flower's aroma this cold November day, since wild blooms have faded away. Octubre lives in a screened-in cage because I couldn't let him out in last week's snow, could I? He seems content, his feet sticky against the screen pleased to drink when I uncurl his proboscis with a toothpick, dip it in honey water while he sucks through his trunk-like tongue. I say he because he has two spots like eyes on his hind side that indicate boy. Good for our family of two lesbians, <laughs> two bitches, a shepherd and a lamb, and 30,000 girl bees who spent the whole autumn dragging the hairy drones out of the hive, killing them, <laughs> dumping the corpses in a heap out front. <laughs> I'm just saying it's good to have some masculine energy around you. <laughs> it's just one monarch. <laughs> hangs upside down all day and sometimes flutters his gorgeous wings. <laughs> uh, this was... Um, I wrote this about the time after um, after my mother had a stroke, and I was married then to a man, and um, who has since passed away. Radiance. I remember when I stopped not believing in God. It sent me to my knees, pleading, hands clasped, like a penitent or a medieval saint transported to the modern age, struck by my mother's stroke. A litany flowed through me of faintly remembered prayers, growing as I spoke, my knees impervious to hard tile, cramped between sink and bath. Yet, when I opened the door, I feigned no inner change knew my husband's unknowingness would try to eclipse my newfound light, turn brilliance to a dull watered gray with his dismissive gaze, the planet of his non-belief blocking me from radiating. I didn't wish to rejoin him in the cave where I once found comfort watching shadows dance. It was the start of the end of us, the beginning of my brighter epoch. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should go around one more time and Maybe each do, do one, one more. Yeah. yeah, And then we'll, um, if you all have any questions or comments, things that you want to share, We'll open that up and we'll also open it to you folks who are joining us on Zoom. Um, you mentioned your mother having a stroke and um, Rosemary was kind of talking about this idea of grief opening us to love. And, and I was thinking a lot when I put together this um, book, The Wonder of Small Things, that part of wonder is the wonder of each other and the wonder of connection. and that we're in a space now where we can gather again in person. And I feel like that pleasure is not lost on me and, and that we can be with our loved ones again. And I was 
uh, lucky enough to, to spend a week with my mother before she passed away. And it was just such a, a week of, you know, sorrow, difficulty, but also uh, really quiet moments of awe and wonder. Um, so this poem was born out of that, and it's called Touch. <clears throat> we are changed by the smallest gestures of touch, as when in my mother's final days, I smoothed the loose gray hairs back from her forehead as she shivered all over, smiling with pleasure, like a lightning bolt shooting through me, she said, the threads of her mind beginning to unravel, though I think we both knew she was talking about love. For the living. When um, the night my son died, we were in Georgia, and I was walking on the road outside in the dark, talking with my friend, Wendy Bidlock, a beautiful poet in Colorado. And she said to me, he has given you his love light to carry. I thought it was the most beautiful thing for someone to say to someone in a moment of loss, to have that sense of inheritance and legacy and ongoingness. At the moment she said it, a firefly lit up right in front of my face like this. He has given you his love light to carry. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my God, Wendy, you won't believe what just happened. I will never forget this. Five minutes later, I said, what did you say again? <laughs> <laughs> but she remembered, thank goodness, he has given you his love light to carry. I'd like to give that phrase to everyone who's lost someone that they love, that they've given you their love light to carry. So I put that in this poem, I credit, of course, that that line is hers. For the living, it is the work of the living to grieve the dead. It is our work to wake each day, to live into the world that is. It is our work to weep, and it is our work to be healed. Some part of us knows not only the absence of our beloveds, but also their presence how they continue to teach us, how they invite us to grow. It is our work to be softened by loss, to be undone, destroyed, remade. Wounded, we recoil, and it is our work to notice how, like crushed and trampled grass, we spring back. It is our work to meet death again, and again, and again, and though it aches to be open, it is our work to be opened, to live into the opening, until we know ourselves as blossoms nourished from within by the radiance of the ones who are no longer physically here. They have given us their love light to carry. It is our work to be in service to that light. Uh, the Rising. I wait on the mountaintop, hearing the symphony of wind in leafless trees, lifting my hair, rising from unseen streams, canyons of air, the sound like ocean surf, rising, falling, rising again. A few white clouds sailing the sky's blue sea. Two eagles rise over me, wheeling infinity symbols around each other. I wait as the gentle, unburning, low sun goldens the weary grass, the scattered, fallen leaves. I wait, but hear only the empty wind growing louder, echoing 
the emptiness inside me, rising to meet the nothing I was seeking. Questions, comments, reflections. Yeah. Um, my sense is that so much there's a real universal reaction to emotions that results in beautiful poetry like you've shared today. So whether it be grief or joy or sorrow, it all transforms itself into these beautiful words and stanzas. So thank you. It's beautifully put. Yeah. It was a blessing for you to begin the reading. Yeah. So thank you for thank you. helping us enter that space. I think you're absolutely right that there is a universality to emotions. And I, I think what's what has been surprising for me over the years, because I lost both of my parents, died when they were quite young, and I've used poetry and writing as a way of healing from that loss. And what's surprising to me is that the more specific I am about the details and my own experience of it, the more universal it feels for other people. And, and that feels true for me too. I think that's true for all art, really, is that it's, I'm thinking about last, two weeks ago, I was with my daughter Vivian, we were at the Playwright Film Festival. Who is there? Okay, just there. Yeah, and, um, and we walked out of the theater and the movie we'd just seen <laughs> was so disturbing. And, uh, and we'd also come out of maybe one or two movies that, that were so uplifting. And I asked her, which would you prefer, to walk out of a movie feeling like I'm so in love with the world or like, oh my gosh, we're in trouble. <laughs> and she said, I just want to feel... Mm. I was so excited about that. <laughs> wow. And I think that this is this is what, what poetry, but what all art is offering us is this chance to show up and feel whatever it is that we feel, right? To take what it is to be alive and meet it and 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 give it back to us, right? Again and again. Here it is again. And just so we can touch it. And, oh, yes. You know, and that thrill that we have, you know, I'm sure you have it too. And you have that kind of stunning thrill of recognition of like, oh, yes, that's it. You know, <laughs> um, which happens with any, any time you touch the truth, whatever that emotion is. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to say thought about that because I think it's so important is that the, but the poet, the artist, of course, the artist also has an obligation to help us bear it. Um, whether that's through form or some wonderful use of language or whatever, um, um, or witness. Um, so when you, for example, with your poem um, uh, about the 10,000 hands, um, no parent can really believe that no parent can believe that, but I put it on the shelf, and I put it on the shelf because you were you were my witness. So that allowed me to contemplate it, and that's an artist's obligation to integrity and form, and to help us bear the unbearable and to experience joy as well. And I think we write to help ourselves bear it first and then mm -hmm. hopefully that act of generosity toward ourselves you know invites other people into that circle and Absolutely. you're right it is an obligation and, and a privilege yeah. yeah but just as a side observation um when we're feeling the depths of life on all levels the importance of bringing humor into it and how much i really appreciated the humor that all of you brought into it to feel the, the grief and the love and the light and then to be able to laugh. And I, I, I thank you for that. I appreciate it. I just heard some quote about that the other day. It was 
it was about how oh, if you if you don't allow the laughter to come in too, that there's like it, it then it you've I wish I remembered it exactly the quote. I'm just destroying it, but but the sense was that if you don't allow for that laughter to also be present, that maybe this is what you like. There's you, you can't bear it, and then you can't bear it. So there, it, you know, it's so essential then to to open up to this full potential of experience. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's about holding the darkness and the light at the same time. We need both, and you know, that helps us bear it because we have to be open to both. And I actually have a poem called Light and Dark that I wrote after uh, reading Laura's Sorrow and Joy poem because I just, that line, sorrow and joy are both holy, just really stuck with me. And the, the Japanese have a word, I'm gonna mispronounce it probably, but it's called komorebe, and it's the light that comes through the leaves of the trees. And so it's this dance of light and shadow on the floor, on a table, you know, and it's this thing of beauty, right? That the light and dark are coexisting and dancing with each other constantly. I wonder if you have thoughts about how poetry could be a source of repair during times of polarity um, in our country and around the world. You're talking about disparate emotions <coughs> and how poetry knits things together or repairs. Um, might you address larger issues and how you would hope poetry could be a piece of the healing? I have a lot of thoughts about that. <laughs> <laughs> because this one actually, oh, I think I, yeah, I have the other ones. Um, I'm not trying to sell you books, but I'm just trying to point out. But you should uh, buy all of these poems. <laughs> these poems have poems. But these, these have been my answer to the polarity and what we're facing. So poetry that turns us toward um, gratitude and hope poetry that turns us to kindness, connection, and joy. And then the latest in the series, which is the Wonder book, poetry that turns us to wonder, awe, moments of peace as a way of repairing our lives because we're so hyper aware of what is broken. Right? Um, and we don't have, we're not given a lot of tools for how to repair it, as you say, and how to um, fix it and how to maybe even just live with the brokenness that does exist around us and do our best to heal and keep together what we can. And I think that poetry with its kind of quiet power and its call to each of us to be more present and to pay more attention <coughs> does really repair a lot of those rifts. Because if you are paying close attention to another person, it's really hard to openly hate them or insult them or, you know, all these things. And, you know, I live in a small town in Vermont and, you know, I'm cautious about honking the horn because right. you never know who's going to be on the other side of that. It might be the person who's taking care of you at the hospital later on. And so I think taking that view and kind of blowing it up to this, this, larger way, it's it's what poetry does. It takes the particular and the specific and says, maybe we can live like this, right, in a more open way. Yeah. Did you? Um, I, well, I, I was thinking of your book, Healing the Divide, which you didn't mention, but, yeah. um, but yes, I think that, um, I mean, I think any practice which it doesn't have to be poetry. Uh, it could be some other art form or the art of meditation, of practicing mindfulness, will lead to greater understanding of the other and, or less, less otherness between oneself and the other. Um, and so that, that practice of just sitting. Yeah. And I read something this morning about um, just being aware of whatever stuff is going on inside of you, you know, as opposed to being critical of whatever's going on inside of you, but opening to it and noticing it. And I thought, oh, that's a whole, a whole 
whole other practice of just being okay with, you know, there, there she is again, that one, that part of oneself has just turned up. How interesting, to, to be interested as opposed to being upset about it, um, which, is, which would end up just getting you into a tangle. But being accepting, I think if we can accept whatever is going on inside of ourselves, then we can be more understanding of others. So well, I just, I wanted to add too that this I think the part of it is this um, this willingness to soften, you know, when we're writing a poem. But I think also when we're reading them, there's an invitation to to vulnerability, and that piece <coughs> is maybe this is this is both what both of you were talking about also. But just I think naming it vulnerability to say I'm willing to to take down my walls and meet you this way is such a healing thing to do. I noticed so well, we've been talking about it a lot actually lately, just in the last couple of days about how if, I, if I'm if i soft and I meet you with this softness, how, how often the other person can bring their softness also, you know, as opposed to <laughs> their defensiveness, which will always end in a war. But the, other thing I think about poetry in specific, but all art, I think, is, is paradox, which is two opposite truths being present at the same time. And poems love paradox. And, and that is, you know, for us in this world to say, this is right, and the other person says, this is right, and for them to come in together and see, oh, multiple rights. It's very hard to do, but a poem loves that. It's always possible in a poem. <laughs> Poems will thrive on that. So, so the more I think as a culture we learn to embrace paradox, so many ways to do it right, multiple rights at the same time. That's thrilling. I think that's thrilling. It doesn't sound right to me. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> we have a comment uh, from Jan and Zoom from Rosemary. She says, thank you for the partnering of music with your poetry. It is the conduit that can also pull in the listening ears. Thank you, Jan. Well, and I, I just want to say, too, that um, Laura's work, Rosemary's work, it, it gives me such permission as a writer. So just please pick up their work if you're, if you're a writer yourself, but even if you're not, there's there is that softening and that reminder to be more present to our everyday world. And, you know, these are two poets who do it for me most often. And, and I so often turn to their work. Thank you. <laughs> and on the spirit of thank yous, um, I have some thank yous for the people who've put this together for us today. Um, this one is for you, Jared. And these are little, very, very small poems that are in, uh, in the book. But earth, heaven, this day, a letter. So that one is for you. And for Allie, who's selling books in the back, this one is a song. Deep desert canyon of the heart, remember when you were ocean. Mm. And this one is for Megan. Thank you for being our tech goddess. <laughs> what if I can't do enough, I said. Love said. What if you don't try? <laughs> <laughs> and this one is for you. Thank you so much. Wrestling the moon oh, until I too I am glowing. Whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, everyone. So we are happy to sign books. If, um, if you purchase those from the folks in the back, we're happy to chat with you. And thank you for being such an amazing audience today and for showing up with us.